And so at last we come to the end of their story. My Gavan and Melanine, I'm Menex Wilaid. My name's Rainbow Dave, and welcome to the final video in this playlist untangling the great tale of Beren and Luthien. And as I say, this is where the story ends. So in the last video, I talked about how Beren fulfilled his quest to deliver a Silmaril to Elu Thingol, and he placed the Silmaril in Thingol's hand, but in so doing, he paid with his life. In fact, he gave his life to save Elu Thingol's. And so, at the foot of the tallest tree in Doriath, Beren lay in the arms of Luthien. She told him to wait for her beyond the Western Sea, and then he looked up into her eyes, and he died, leaving Luthien to grieve in Middle-earth without him. But although a lot of Tolkien's First Age tales are super tragic, Beren and Luthien isn't really one of them. At least not in the same way as the others. And that's because this tale is one of the very rare stories that doesn't actually end with the death of its main character. But before we can get into what happens next, I first need to talk all about what happens to men and elves in Middle-earth when they die. And the absolute first thing that I need to point out is a distinction between two elven terms, Hroa and Fea. So when it comes to incarnate beings, and that's like men and elves and dwarves and hobbits and ents and basically anything that isn't a Valar or a Maya, these guys have both a Hroa and a Fea. The Hroa, that refers to their physical body, which we're told is made of the substance of Arida. However, their Fea is their indwelling spirit, or perhaps we could even say their soul. And these come from outside of the universe. These are delivered directly by Iluvatar. Unlike a Hroa, a Fea cannot be destroyed. But not all Hroa and Fea are made the same. And this segues me back once again to my favourite elf in this story, Fenrod Felagund. You thought we were done with him, but we're not. So, in the book Morgoth's Ring, there is a section called Athrobeth Finrod Ar Andreth, which just means the debate of Finrod and Andreth. And this is a very philosophical essay in which Tolkien explores a lot of metaphysical themes through a dialogue between the immortal Finrod Felagund and the mortal woman Andreth Syalind, who I talked about in this video. And one of the things that Andreth and Finrod talk about is the nature of elven Fea and elven Hroa compared to the Fea and Hroa of men. One of the things that Finrod says is the Fea of men, though close akin indeed to the Fea of the Quendi, are yet not the same. For strange as we deem it, we see clearly that the Fea of men are not, as ours are, confined to Arda nor is Arda their home. And this is a hugely fundamental difference between elves and men, between immortals and mortals. Regardless of what happens to the Hroa, the Fea of an elf cannot leave the confines of Arda. And Arda is of course the name of the planet upon which both Middle-earth and the undying lands in Amman are continents. However, the Fea of men have to eventually leave Arda. And this is why we see that elves envy death, the gift of men. Men have a freedom in death that elves can never share. The Fea of men are free to pass beyond the circles of the world and to be reunited with Iluvatar outside of creation in the timeless halls. Elves cannot do this. Men must do this. Now, obviously, there are downsides to dying and upsides to immortality, but by understanding the union of Hroa and Fea, we are able to fully understand exactly what Tolkien means when he talks about men being mortal and elves being immortal. Obviously, all Hroa can be destroyed and dissolved, that is a fact of experience, but the difference between elvish death and mannish death is that when a man's Hroa is destroyed, their Fea travels west for a short time, but it is then released back to Iluvatar, whereas an elf's Fea is simply exiled 
or houseless when their body is lost, but it is still very much bound to ardour. In fact, in the words of Finrod Felagund, death is simply defined as the severing of these two. And deathlessness is simply that the two should remain united forever. In fact, the violent separation of Thea from Hroa, basically being killed, is considered wholly unnatural, and it would never have happened in a world without Melkor. Imagine for a moment if Melkor never had corrupted Iluvatar's creation, then no one would ever have been slain, and there would have been no disease to end life prematurely. Instead, elves would have just lived forever in their home of Arda, with Thea and Hroar perfectly in sync, and men would have awoken as guests in Arda, and they would have lived alongside the elves and become ennobled by them and shared a few years with them, but then eventually they would have freely relinquished their lives, and their Thea would peacefully leave their Hroa. This is what happens to Aragorn. He is not killed by old age, he simply relinquishes his life, and his Thea then returns home to Iluvatar in the Timeless Halls. However, thanks to Melkor, that is of course not how things end up going for most men. But why am I talking about this? How is it relevant? Well, if we return to Beren and Luthien, we'll see that Beren's Hroa has been chewed up by a werewolf and pumped full of Karkaroth's venom. The Hroa has been destroyed, and so now Beren's Thea is exiled and homeless, and destined to depart Arda forever. He will never be reunited with Luthien. Her elven Thea is bound to Arda. Except, remember, in Luthien's final words to Beren, she bid him await her beyond the Western Sea. So, just like all incarnate beings, when Beren's Hroa was slain, his Fea was summoned into the uttermost West to be judged and held before departing Arda forever. And the place that souls go to, to be held and judged in Tolkien's writings, is the Halls of Mandos. And the Halls of Mandos are a very cool place to talk about. We are told that they stand on the north shores of Valinor, facing the encircling sea, the Echaia, the outer ocean that surrounds all the lands in Arda. Beyond that, there are only the Walls of Night. Anyway, the cavernous halls of Mandos are ever-growing as the world ages, and more and more halls are added as more and more souls are held and judged there. We know that there's a section for dead elves, where their Thea await the time of their rehousing into a new Hroa, and there's also a section for dead men, where they await their mysterious onward journey of which not even the Valar truly know the details. And, according to Dwarven law and religion, there is also said to be a separate section in the Halls of Mandos that were constructed by Aule himself, the father of the dwarves, and he set these halls aside to hold their Thea after death. But the afterlife of the dwarves is very mysterious, and Tolkien never explicitly explains what happens to them. Now, technically, that word, Mandos, it actually refers to the place, the halls, and the name of the guy who keeps watch over them is Namo. However, in every single instance that this character is mentioned in the Silmarillion, except for the first two sentences that tell us that his name is Namo, he is referred to exclusively as Mandos. And Mandos is a very important member of the Valar. He is one of the Feanturi, the master of spirits. And his main job role is being the proclaimer of doom and prophecy and judgment. And contrary to, I guess, what some people might assume, although Mandos is the keeper of the dead, he's not really like the god of death. And he's certainly not a villainous character. In fact, Mandos is a thoroughly benevolent character and a staunch enemy of Morgoth and all his servants. Although it is probably fair to say that Mandos isn't particularly nice. He's good, but he's not nice. We are told that Mandos is solemn, and at times terrible, and one of the key words that Tolkien associates with him is inexorable, which means either impossible to stop or impossible to persuade. Mandos and his judgments are utterly 
inescapable. Or at least they have been until now. We'll come back to Mandos, but for now, just be aware that it is in Mandos's halls that Beren is waiting for Luthien, unwilling to leave the world until Luthien came to say her last farewell. So, let's now jump back to Luthien and to the story that I've been telling for the past ten weeks. As Beren died, Luthien held him, and we're told that in that moment, the starlight was quenched and darkness had fallen even upon Luthien Tenuviel. She lingered for less than an hour in Middle-earth, for without Beren there was no light left in her life, and eventually her spirit also departed her body, and she died like a flower that is suddenly cut off and lies for a while unwithered on the grass. And so, after the passing of Luthien, winter fell upon Eluthingol and the kingdom of Doriath. And for the first time in over 3,000 years, Middle-earth exists without the light of Luthien. Her Hroa remains untouched by decay, but her Fea passes into the uttermost west, and thus she too comes to dwell within the halls of Mandos. But of all the spirits that inhabit this place, Luthien's is unique. We are told that her beauty was more than the beauty of all others, and her sorrow was deeper than of any others. And so, when Luthien is brought before Mandos for her judgement, she sang to him a song most fair that ever in words was woven, and the song most sorrowful that ever the world shall hear. Unchanged, imperishable, it is sung still in Valinor, beyond the hearing of the world, and listening, the Valar are grieved. And Luthien's song is pretty incredible. Tolkien writes that she wove two themes of words, of the sorrow of the Eldar and the grief of men. And as she sings it, she kneels before Mandos, and her tears fell upon his feet like rain upon the stones. And what happens next is amazing. For we are told that Mandos, the inexorable Mandos, the unmovable Mandos, was moved to pity. He who never before was so moved, nor has been since. And so Mandos summons before his throne the Fea of Beren, and the two lovers are once again reunited beyond the Western Sea. But although this is undoubtedly a lovely moment, it cannot last. Mandos is powerless to withhold the spirits of men within the confines of the world after their time of waiting, nor could he change the fates of the children of Iluvatar. But even so, Luthien's song does move Mandos to do something utterly unprecedented. He goes to his boss and asks his advice, his only real superior within Arda. And that is, of course, the king of the Valar, Manwe, who governed the world under the hand of Iluvatar. And so Manwe listened to Mandos's tale, and then Manwe sought counsel in his innermost thought where the will of Iluvatar was revealed. And as it goes, Iluvatar is willing to make an exception on account of Luthien's labours and her sorrow. But it comes at a cost. Luthien must make a choice. So, you don't need me to tell you by now that Luthien's actions in life were pretty spectacular, and she played an instrumental part in fulfilling Iluvatar's plan. So, the first option that she's given is to be immediately released from the halls of Mandos, and to go and dwell in Valimar, that's the capital of Valinor, alongside the Valar themselves. There, she will live in bliss until the end of the world, forgetting all griefs that her life had known. And this does seem like a pretty wonderful offer, but she would still be without Beren. 
She would be without all memory of him, in fact, for even Manwe and Mandos cannot take the gift of death away from Beren. His Feyre has to be able to leave Arda, it is his right as a mortal man. And so Luthien is offered the second choice. She might return to Middle-earth and take with her Beren, there to dwell again but without certitude of life or joy. Then she would become mortal and subject to a second death, and ere long she would leave the world forever and her beauty would become only a memory in song. And this is the doom that Luthien chooses. She renounces all claim to an immortal life in eternal bliss for the sake of a fleeting life with Beren. And remember, there are absolutely no guarantees attached to this choice. Beleriand is at war. They could be slain by violence or sickness at any time, and there will be no way for Luthien to sing her way out of a second death. But she accepts the terms. Such is her love for Beren. And so, Luthien becomes the first ever elf to forsake immortality and choose a mortal life. And it also means that Luthien will be the first elf to truly die. Obviously, Feanor and Fingolfin and Finrod Felagund have all already died, but their Feyr are still in Arda, in fact they can't ever leave Arda, they may still one day be reunited with their loved ones. But Luthien never will. When she dies, she will be gone forever. She will never be with her parents or her people ever again. But she will be with Beren, at least for a short time. And so, just like that, Beren and Luthien are both returned to Middle-earth, and they are awarded a second life. And if you're into your ancient European mythology, then you may very well be thinking that this part of the tale bears striking similarities to a few real-world myths. I guess the most obvious example, if you know ancient Greek mythology, is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice which features the greatest singer ever journeying down into the underworld to plead with Hades in granting a second life for Eurydice. But there is another myth that is slightly less famous, but I think it's even more pertinent to Tolkien's legendarium, and that is the ancient Norse and Germanic tale of Balder. So very basically, and I'm not an expert on this, but very basically, Balder was a son of Odin, and Loki tricked some blind guy called Hod into shooting mistletoe at Balder, which killed him because of reasons. And then Balder's brother Hermod ventured into the Norse underworld, Hel, and there he encountered the Keeper of Hel, whose name is also Hel. And then Hermod asked Hel to let Balder return with him and live a second life, because he says that everyone in the world is weeping and is filled with sorrow at the death of Balder. And so Hel says that she will let Balder go, but only on the condition that all things around the world, whether living or dead, all of them must weep for Balder to prove that no one disliked him. As it goes, there is a giantess called Vuk, who is most likely Loki in disguise, and she doesn't weep, and so Balder stays in hell. Now, on the one hand, this story may seem to have very little in common with Beren and Luthien, but it is a story that I'm sure Tolkien would have been familiar with. And along with the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, these three tales do share a few salient similarities. Luthien and Orpheus are both incredible musicians who move the Keeper of the Dead to pity with their songs, and Luthien and Hermod both evoke pity and sorrow to try and rescue their beloved hero. And in all three cases, the Keeper of the Dead does finally relent and he allows the deceased to return to life, but only on some very bittersweet condition. Orpheus must leave the underworld without turning to look if Eurydice is behind him, Hermod must obviously convince all things to weep, and Luthien must give up her immortality. However, Luthien is unique among the three in that she is the only one who actually does succeed in getting her guy to live again. Anyway, we're not told much about the mechanics of how Beren and Luthien returned to Middle-earth, but we know that they did. 
and we know that from this moment on, Luthien is mortal. And there's an interesting question here that I think about quite a lot, although Tolkien gives us absolutely no clues in answering it. Does Beren return to life with one hand or with two? Was he given a brand new body to inhabit, or was his old body somehow restored to life? It's hardly a big deal, but it does make me wonder sometimes. Anyway, for a time, the two of them returned to Doriath, and Luthien healed the winter of Thingol with a touch of her hand. However, Luthien's mother, Melian, cannot be so easily assuaged. Melian is of course not an elf, she is a Maya. And so, more so than any elf, she really does understand the gravity of Luthien's decision. Even if Luthien were held in the halls of Mandos for millennia, Melian wouldn't really be parted with her. The whole Fea Hroa thing doesn't really apply to Melian. Maya are not incarnate beings. They don't need a Hroa to house their Fea. Instead, they are what Tolkien called Eala, which means their spirits need no body to be complete, and they can choose their physical forms, Fana is the elvish word for that, and they wear their tangible bodies as raiments, like clothing, whenever and for however long they desire. At least they do if they're not corrupted by Morgoth. So Melian has never really needed to even entertain the idea that she would ever be parted for good from her loved ones. If Thingol were ever to be killed, she could simply go west and wait for him. And if her Fana were ever slain, she could just throw it off and take another. But even a Maya cannot change the gift of men, the gift from Iluvatar. For the first time in her life, Melian is powerless. She knows she's going to lose her daughter forever, and that there's nothing she can do about it. Tolkien even tells us that no grief of loss has been heavier than the grief of Melian the Maya in that hour. And so, eventually, Beren and Luthien leave Doriath, and they journey together into the summery south of Beleriand to enjoy whatever time they have left together in peace. And they dwelt there on a green island called Tol Galen, and forever after this land was known to the elves as Dorfiuni Gwinar, the land of the dead that live. Tolkien describes this place as like a vision of the land of the Valar, and no place has since been so fair, so fruitful, or so filled with light. And so it is here that Beren and Luthien live out the rest of their days, until all tidings of them ceased. No mortal man spoke ever again with Beren son of Barahir, and none saw Beren or Luthien leave the world, or marked where at last their bodies lay. And with that beautifully bittersweet last line, we come to the end of the tale of Beren and Luthien. Well, sort of. You see, the next First Age playlist that I make will be all about the fifth battle of Beleriand, the greatest battle yet, and after that will come the epic tale of the children of Hurin, and neither of those stories are going to feature Beren or Luthien, but after that we will come to a little story that kind of serves as a bit of a sequel to this one. Because, despite what Tolkien just wrote, this is not actually the last time that we see Beren and Luthien in the Silmarillion. They sit out a good deal of what comes next, just living happily together in peace, but they will return to the story before the very end. And I don't want to spoil that story right now, but I will say that one of its major characters is a guy called Dior Eluhil, which means Dior, heir of Eluthingol. And thus, Dior Eluhil is of course the son of Beren and Luthien. And in the tale of Dior, we'll talk about Doriath and that Silmaril that Beren gave to Eluthingol, and we will also see one of the most awesome cameos ever from Old Man Beren. And it's not even like a little blink and you miss it cameo either. Before the end of the First Age, we will see 70-year-old Beren charging into battle with a host of Ents behind him. So just you wait. Beren and Luthien's tale may be over, but I promise we will see them again. 
However, we have come to the end of this video, which means we've also come to the end of this whole playlist. And I really hope you guys enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. And I really hope you guys are up for more First Age drama. Because in the relatively near future, I will begin the next First Age series, which will be shorter than this one, but no less epic, no less tragic, and no less important. Because, of course, the tale of Beren and Luthien is a very self-contained one, and although I've talked a lot over these past 11 videos about these two characters, I've not really mentioned much else of what has been going on in Beleriand. I've barely mentioned the Noldor's High King, Fingon, or the Princes Maedros or Maglor, or the Great Dwarves of the Blue Mountains, or any other clans of men beside Berens. But... In the next series, all of that is going to change, because thanks to the actions of Beren and Luthien, all of Beleriand now knows that Morgoth is not untouchable. If one man and one elf can steal a Silmaril from inside his fortress, what can the combined armies of all the free people do? To find out the answer to that, stay tuned for my next First Age series where I will give the Neoniath Arinoidiad, the fifth battle, the greatest conflict yet, the full Tolkien Untangled treatment. So to make sure you don't miss all that's yet to come, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit like and leave a comment on this video if you want to. But thank you so much for watching the tale of Beren and Luthien, and as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Nevaya Melanine.